is that the founding fathers could not possibly have imagined what it would be like if we strapped trillions of dollars of debt into our youngest workers in order that they can get a piece of paper that says, hey, corporation, if you hire this person, you can pay them within this price band because other people that have that same degree also get, get paid within that price band. So you can't be blamed for having any sort of discrimination. So in order to get that piece of paper, you have to pay extreme amounts of money. You go into debt to take on those student loans. You get into the corporation. And now if you lose that job, the, the thing that carries you to another place is do you have that piece of paper? And I think universities have gone amok in how much they're charging students and what they're delivering. And I think that it's been allowed to, it, it's not just the university's fault. There's all these forces coming together. The, the government saying you can't declare bankruptcy on student loans, corporations want, not wanting to get sued. What do you think is the state's role in, in metting this out? Because I think that the student loan debt prepares us for a situation where a strong man can come in and say, come with me, I will wipe out your debts. All you have to do is give me power. Well, I think we're, um, and maybe what you're getting at here is, uh, I think we're on the verge, and I don't know what it looks like, I don't presume to know, um, but uh, a, a, a massive disruption as it relates to higher education, because <clears throat> the idea that we have a model that's still based after the Oxford model, uh, that's a few, at least a few hundred years old now, of educating people in this age of economic disruption we just talked about, how quickly things can change. The idea <clears throat> that you'll know everything you need to know um, and learn from the ages of you know 18 to 22 for the rest of your life um, is going to change. It's not realistic anymore. In, in if you graduate, I gave a commencement a year ago about this and, and mentioned this. We're a college graduate today. So again, thinking about this uh, as early as the the uh, as recently as the early 1980s, job, and we talk about job change. Most people, in fact, well over 80% of people, they weren't just in one industry their entire working lifetime. They were in one job, right? You got a job. And this was a lot of my family experience. I had an uncle that worked at AT&T for 30 years. I had another uncle that worked at Anheuser-Busch for 30 years. My dad worked. My dad was, it was interesting. My dad started out as a, as a butcher and went to night school. Uh, at Lindenwood and got his degree while he had a young family. So he worked during the day, went to night school. Oh, night we will revisit this because I yeah. want to talk about the butchers in the state of Missouri. This yeah. So, um, but uh, he, uh, anyway, so he gets his college degree and works at Anheuser-Busch uh, for 30 years. Another uncle that worked at Boeing for 30 years. That doesn't happen anymore, right? I mean, you've got people graduating from college today that will not just change jobs, but careers, entire industries three times in their first decade of work. And that's only gonna accelerate, right? And so do we have a university or higher education model that addresses that right now? We don't. And, um, you know, I think a lot of universities are stubborn in this regard. Um, there's a model that they've created that has worked well for them, but it's not really working well for the people. And especially, you know, not just the students, but the middle-class families who want their kids to have a, you know, a better life. We want every generation to do better than the last. I know certainly as a dad, that's what I want for my kids. I want them to get a great education and have every opportunity right here in Missouri. I don't want them to have to go anywhere else uh, to do that. I, and selfishly, I want them to be here and, and you know, hopefully they have grandkids, you know, have grandkids and they're in, you know, Missouri and all that. Um, and in, so my, in my theoretical knowledge of economics, right, about how the, how the world functions best, it is when human beings are able to go to a job very easily. Somebody says, I have a problem. You have a solution. I'm willing to pay you for that exchange. And maybe you come in for six months. Maybe you come in for two years. Maybe you come in for 10 years. Doesn't really matter. But that you can leave and enter smoothly. But now the, the, the fear of litigation, the fear of being sued as a corporation means that they take so much longer. And you could say, well, that's protecting the individual. So that that way, if they are mistreated by a corporation, then they have the ability to protect themselves. But the flip side of that is, then we gum up these, these organizations. If you become a company of a certain size, you can no longer freely hire people and let them go and push them towards getting more education. And we're, we're limiting the signals that people have that you're becoming obsolete because your skills are not up to date. And instead of 
clearing that out quickly and saying, Hey, you know, you're, you're a little behind, go, go learn some more things and come right back. And it's easy to bring you out and bring you back in. We have some different system now. And if this doesn't change, how do American corporations in general grow well, and thrive? Well, what's interesting is um, <clears throat> you're right. Um, like you're going to have a lot more 50 year olds that need different skills to adapt who still have a decade of work left in them, right? Like, or more. Um, we've got to figure this out for people because we all know what earned success means. Um, you know, whatever happiness quotient you believe in, um, earned success plays a big role in that, right? Um, and so people- Oh, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. What, what is this? Well, I mean, I, so there's a lot of different theories on, you know, what is happiness? Uh, Arthur Brooks um, wrote a book called The Conservative Heart a few years ago, and he was the executive. I have it upstairs. I didn't, you know Arthur Brooks? Yeah. I've I had a him. chance to meet him. He's a very yeah. interesting character. He's one He's of those a, people that when I first met him, I was like, you are a faux Zen master guy. And then you start listening to him and you're like, no, you're actually a Zen master Yeah, he's a guy. smart guy. Well, it's interesting. That he's got a, I was educated by Jesuits and he's got a lot of uh, sort of Jesuit influence too. I told him that. And so I got, I've been invited to be part of this AEI, which was the group he was part of the American Enterprise. Me Institute. too. Oh, I was really? In the, yes, I was in the class, I think after years. And by the way, I have a degree from Marquette. So I'm also a Jesuit. All right, I, I, there you go. I believe deeply in the, in the learning. See, this is the commonality that we can only have when we have a, you know, cultural pluralism. Um, but yeah, no, so uh, in, in that book, he talks about, you know, a lot of what his writings have been about, what, what is happiness? What makes you happy? And, you know, there's a lot of it that sort of the things you can control are, your, you know, family, faith, and work. Knowing that pe somebody relies on you when you get up, right, in the morning and you go to work or you're doing what you do, that somebody's counting on you, that what you do matters and you get meaning from it and that earned success has a lot to do with how we feel, right? And and our outlook on the world. And that's really important. So when we talk about education, it's not, we're not talking about it in a vacuum or in a silo. It has a profound impact on people for the rest of their lives. And so you're right, people entering and exiting is really important. I think there's a really, and I gave a speech to the community college uh, group a couple years ago. There's a great opportunity for these community colleges to step into that role. Um, whereas, as opposed to just being viewed as sort of a feeder school, um, as they were before, like a, you know, a junior college and then people, but, you know, go to, go to a four year after that. And that's still an important role to play if people, um, it's very economical to do so. But if somebody wants to gather a different skill or something's changed or the economic landscape that they can move in and out of an institution of higher education uh, to develop those skills and have that kind of meaning and continue to work for decades is important. And well, I, I think one of, one of the parts of this culture change that is going to happen is that because people have pulled their kids out of the regular school system, they now have seen some of their kids blossom in ways they had never thought before. So they're going to think about education in a different way. And now the, the fundamental drumbeat of university, 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 that is the, if you were a successful kid in high school, then your next step is obviously college. I think that's going to be questioned in a very real way. I have an intern right now who said, if I go back to school, at most, I can go to one third of my classes in person. Otherwise, it's online and we're right. not changing my tuition. And he's a super sweet guy. He wants the university to succeed. He loves that experience. But he's also looking and saying, I don't know, it, it, should I take on that debt? Yeah, well, the, corona, the coronavirus is, I think, opening up people's eyes, too, of a different way. Uh, we need to get better at it, but a different way that people can be educated. So this brick and mortar model uh, building a bunch of buildings on campus and having the, and, you know, and the part of the reason why tuition is so high is that, you know, everybody's trying to keep up with the Joneses on what that new building looks like or what that dorm looks like. Maybe that's going to change a little bit, right? And that people value different things uh, moving forward. And I, I think there's a space for a massive disruption. Again, I don't pretend to know what that looks like, but I think it's coming and uh, it will probably be better for it. Ah, ah, ah.